my colleagues. This is our second day of this valuable conference. Thanks all for your attending this well-planned well event. Our special great thanks to Professor Dr. Manel El Mahdi, who spent out her tremendous effort and time into arranging uh, this valuable event. Uh, our uh, starting professor today will be Professor Maisal Hosseini. Professor Maisal Hosseini is a consultant and full member of the King Hussein Cancer Center in Amman, Jordan. Uh, she is the chair institutional review board, uh, board of the King Hussein Cancer Center ex-president of International Academy of Pathology, Arab Division. Uh, she is graduated from Jordan University, Faculty of Medicine, and trained initially at Pathology Department at Jordan University Hospital, and completed training in UK and certified as FRC Path. Okay, doctor, it's your floor. Thank you very much. Sabah al khair jamian. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Well, allow me to thank the organizing committee. Well, special, very big thank you for Dr. Manal Mahdi. I'm sure the effort she invested, the time and, and, and number of hours invested is huge. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Manal. So uh, uh, perhaps many of you know of me as a neuropathologist, but the other speciality that I'm interested in and quite a trained well in is uh, gynecological pathology as well. So when Dr. Manal asked me to uh, choose a topic, I thought in a way I would like people leaving the room with some important tips that are useful for di their daily practice and diagnosis. Lino essentially what I believe is that المعلومات موجودة بالكتب okay so or in articles it's all available and nowadays really obtaining a piece of information is not that difficult what is difficult in my very humble view is to apply had a piece of information into our practice على list like that for the care of the patient okay so this is why I've chosen this tips for a practicing endometrial carcinoma tips for a practicing pathologists and I'll be complementing the presentation with a slide seminar so wherever many of the issues that we're going to discuss will be covered later on with the live slide seminar well, it depends on the time I have a good number of cases it depends on the time we'll see how it goes so I have no disclosures and this is the outline don't panic at all I think I did on bar 24 issues so we'll start actually with the epidemiology of endometrial carcinoma why endometrial carcinoma why is endometrial carcinoma important when we look at the word uh, um, uh, incidence and mortality rate for endometrial carcinoma it accounts for the six it's the six most common cancer in females when it comes to mortality, it's the 13th uh, uh, cause of cancer death in female patients. However, what really is important, you can miss the incidence rate or mortality rate. So this is what is called the prevalence of cases. And if we look at the prevalence of endometrial carcinoma in female patients, it's the fifth most common prevalent cancer in female according to Globocan 2020. And the incidence is not really uniform through, throughout the world. There are countries with uh, that are really high incidence, so there are countries that are perhaps not reported or they have lower incidence. Endometrial carcinoma is known to be the single most common uh, uh, gynecological malignancy in Western countries, and most cases actually occur there. If we focus in more into our region, it appears that countries of the Gulf area, in particular Saudi Arabia, and unfortunately Jordan, Egypt seems to be okay in terms of the incidence of endometrial carcinoma. Now, what about the trends of endometrial carcinoma? The number of endometrial carcinoma appears to be mushrooming, increasing globally, and it is estimated that by 2040, something like 50% increase in the number of endometrial carcinoma will be encountered worldwide. What is really was surprising when I was preparing the presentation is that Saudi Arabia, 
appears to be among the countries witnessing a, no, a high number or a high increase in the incidence of endometrial carcinoma. What about mortality? Again, there is a discrepancy in the mortality. Unfortunately, the incidence is not that high in countries with lower resources, but the mortality rate in general is highest in countries with limited resources. And if we focus in again into our region, Again, the countries with the higher uh, number of incident cases, Saudi Arabia followed by Jordan, appear also to have a higher number of or uh, an increased mortality rate. And again, trends in mortality, in general, there is globally a decrease in the mortality of endometrial carcinoma, but when it comes to countries with limited resources, lil asaf, the mortality is increasing. So what are the risk factors? Lacial endometrial cancer appears to be increasing globally. We all know, even the medical students, it's obesity, decreased physical activity, and diabetes. A very important team can overlook the risk factor is extended life expectancy. So with aging population, we tend to see increase in the number of endometrial carcinoma. And remember, this is unfortunate in a way because actually the tumors, endometrial carcinoma, that comes with old age is not the same as the one that comes with younger age a group. And there appears also an association with the decrease in the use of estrogen plus progesterone, protective effect in menopausal hormone therapy. We almost always overlook genetic factors as a cause of endometrial carcinoma. Please, and I know the next speaker will be covering as well something unrelated to the same issue, Lynch syndrome. So any endometrial carcinoma, this is perhaps number one message for Muhadara. Any endometrial carcinoma occurring in a premenopausal female patient, always, always think of Lynch syndrome. Always rule out Lynch syndrome. Always ask for fam family history of cancer and personal history of cancer. And we know that Lynch syndrome is uh, um, uh, inherited as autosomal dominant cancer. It's usually in the fourth and fifth decades of life. So around the perimenopausal area, 45 to 50 years of age, and in general, if we see mutations in MSH2, MSH6, or PMS2, this is Lynch syndrome, full stop. When it comes to MLH1, we have to remember that the most common uh, uh, cause for the silencing of MLH1 is actually hypermethylation. So we have to be aware, and I have some examples actually. The case uh, presentation seminar will, will complement the muhadara. And if we look, look into the, the incidence of endometrial carcinoma in Lynch syndrome, uh, we, we all know when we talk Lynch syndrome, what is the first thing colorectal cancer. In females, it's actually endometrial cancer, and sometimes it even surpasses the incidence or the presentation of colorectal cancer. And the female patients be frequently as endometrial cancer as the fir first presentation. It's around perimenopausal area. Remember, it's type 1, not type 2 endometrial cancer, that uh, carcinoma associated with Lynch syndrome. Come on, for a reporting pathologist, it's extremely important to be aware of the staging system and how the FIGO system is equivalent and what is the equivalency between the FIGO system and the more common system that we use in pathology, the TNM staging system. بشكل عام when is a clinician, a gynecologist, a TNM, TNM PT3 and 0, we have to put the FIGO staging system. So what is the difference? Both of them were uh, 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 latestly uh, updated in 2018. FIGO system, when it started, it was a clinical staging system, but then it evolved into a surgical staging system. So usually it's the gynecologist who will be the staging system, and this is usually done before or during the surgery and does not take account into the treatment. Is a marida receive neoadjuvant treatment, you should never stage the patient with FIGO based on the finding post neoadjuvant treatment. This is extremely important. patient FIGO stage one, while in reality, by clinical biopsies and radiology, she was a stage three. 
So while TNM is used by clinicians and pathologists and it's really a common language with other systems, it allows for accommodating therapy. We know that in the TNM staging, we put the prefix Y, it denotes neoadjuvant treatment, and then the stage after the treatment. صح? يعني ممكن المريضة تكون PT3 initially clinically TNM T3, بس لما تيجي the biopsy or the hysterectomy, it can PT1. قبلها من حط Y معناته بنفهم تماما إنه this is in relation to treatment, post-therapy. In FIGO, ma fi had al haki. And it becomes really extremely confusing for the clinicians iza ihna bin hot il post new adjuvant treatment. And mitil mahakitilkom, the staging rahni hiki ali hum bit tafsil wahda wahda wahna machine. But it's very important to, to be aware of this is a rakam tinin message. Number two message is to be aware of this equivalent, zay tahwil. إنه كيف إحنا بنعمل currency exchange rate it's exactly the same what is TNM as pathologist and what is the equivalent in FIGO and remember FIGO ما إله post new adjuvant treatment um, um, equivalent زيه زي TNM so أول إشي بوصلنا إحنا in a form the clinical data for the patient the presentation دائما please make it like a habit to ask about personal history of cancer as well as family history of cancer. When it comes to personal history of cancer, شغلتين, we have to look for genetic predisposition and we have to look for breast carcinoma with the hormonal adjuvant treatment. Because sometimes adult patients, they develop, they go on to develop endometrial carcinoma in, in various forms. So it's extremely important to ask about the personal history of cancer as well as the family history of cancer. So what are the types of specimens that we re uh, uh, receive? It's either a biopsy, we are all aware of, DNC or office procedures or through hysteroscopy, and there seems to be a good uh, um, equivalent uh, um, uh, yani concordance between the biopsies and the following hysterectomy. Usually, sometimes, not usually, sometimes there might be an upstaging, upgrading or undergrading of the tumor, but in general, these uh, biopsies, are really sufficient to, rent, to render the initial diagnosis. What about resections? So when we receive resection, we have to know what type of resection we receive. Why? It's very important to determine the parameters according to which the staging will be determined as well as the adjuvant treatment. So it's extremely important to know the difference between a simple hysterectomy, the orange, a hysterectomy uterus camel, usually with bilateral salvage or phorectomy, or sometimes, unfortunately, sub, uh, sub, uh, uh, sub, uh, um, simple supraclavicular or subtotal hysterectomy where the cervix is not included, or the radical hysterectomy where the parametrium and part of the vagina is included, or the modifications to bound them. It's extremely important to know the specimen in front of me, what does it contain, what is it composed of. Muhim jiddan jiddan, and we'll see as we go on with, uh, uh, with, the, with the rest of the lecture. Shagli kaman ktir muhim, and perhaps again, this is kind of overlooked. Ihna mish ktir mihtam milha, lahad manu abil matab. In the route through which the surgery was done, is it laparotomy? or laparoscopic, extremely important because there are some artifacts associated with laparoscopic surgery that might result in upstaging of the patient. Is it, and if I don't know really the implications of the findings and the initial surgery, the route of the surgery or the modality of the surgery. So usually for an endometrial carcinoma, what we receive, uh, in the pathology for surgical staging, total hysterectomy with bilateral salbingeophorectomy, pelvic lymph node dissection, paraaortic lymph node dissection. If the tumor on the biopsy, on the initial biopsy, was type 2 or high grade, we tend to be ovarian carcinoma. Okay? So they would proceed to uh, uh, to perform omentectomy, peritoneal biopsies and washing, and the bladder and bowel biopsies. So is it kind of type 1 endometriote carcinoma been what if into these three components usually? If it was higher grade or type 2 uh, endometrial carcinoma, they will 
in a way, it treat, including the surgery, similar to ovarian carcinoma, so keep this in mind. Tayyip, the pathologist, will follow the specimen, a grossing. Orientation is extremely important. Description, including the entirety. If the uterus was previously opened, incised, you have to clearly document. I actually call the surgeon. By the way, your uterus was open, and if there is contamination on the um, margins, perhaps I'll not be able sure to confirm your margins are positive or negative. I always document this. Because of the artifacts that happens in relation to a previous manipulation of the specimen, Marat al pathologist, Sarah Habikun with tied hands, cannot be 100% sure if vascular invasion will allow margins are positive or no. So, oh, Anna, since I've been working with them for more than 10 years, they know. It's our job as pathologists to open the biopsy because you know sometimes curiosity kills the cat. It really kills the cat, it killed the specimen. I can never be sure of uh, uh, potential, some potential um, determinant effect of previous incision or perhaps a fragmentation of the biopsy. Is our slitney fragmented? I have to write it down. And it was a fragmented, received in pieces. Okay, so a gross, and I always tell them, when they work with me, if it's not a bad thing, it's If the gross is wrong, all the specimen, it's not important the pathology, it's not a bad gross is wrong. So it's extremely important. Grossing is, uh, I cannot really overemphasize the importance of a proper grossing of, the, of any specimen with endometrial carcinoma in this uh, instance. We have to ink the margins. Actually, uterus fee margins, yes, it has margins. We have the ectocervical or the vaginal margin, and we have the parametrium and paracervix. So yes, مثل مثل colorectal cancer, مثل مثل stomach, there are margins for the uterus, believe it or not. And then we have to describe the sectioning. The tumor site is extremely important. Is it in the body, the fundus, or, and I highlighted, lower uterine segment. And I'll be describing horn, come and show you why lower uterine segment is extremely important. So, a tumor dimensions, command, it's a very important because it seems that a cut off point of two centimeter, tumors that are uh, uh, less than two, smaller than two centimeters, fare better, much better than tumors that are larger than two centimeters. If I can, the depth of myometrial invasion, sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot, other sites of involvement, and command, importantly, we can the designation of the blocks. Min wain akhadna? Is it from the lower uterine segment or not? Extremely important. We're going to talk why it's extremely important. So whether it's a biopsy or a hysterectomy, we might encounter the first lesion, which are the precursor lesions for endometrial carcinoma, endometrial hyperplasia. And you know that there were updates in the classification of endometrial hyperplasias into those without atypia or with atypia. So no longer cystic will complex. What is really important is the presence or absence of a nuclear atypia. And this is, we all know, it's uh, encountered in patients with a prolonged exposure to unopposed estrogen. And we know, there is an increase in the gland to stromal ratio. But in the case of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia, the changes are uniform. It's all over. Any focus, and about salaleha, any focus I look at, it's exactly the same. So as if it's it's mirror image with increase in the uh, nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, sometimes what we call telescoping, and bishikil am had the cytological changes are as uniform. So and I'm moving from one uh, focus of one field to the other in the slide, and it's all showing the same. This is in contrast to endometrial atypical hyperplasia or endometrioid intraepithelial carcinoma, which really is a clue word, it's a clonal expansion. So against uh, normal or uh, uh, a typical hyperplasia, I see an area, a focus of a crowded glands with cytological atypia, 
And this is better, uh, yani best really documented or best uh, witnessed if I compare the, in, uh, the atypical glands with the enlarged nuclei, with the stratification, with the presence of mitosis, with adjacent normal. So really what happens, sometimes there is entrapment of what is normal endometrial glands adjacent or in between the glands with the atypical features. And why it's important to differentiate between typical and atypical, especially is a candidate on biopsy because of the risk of subsequent development of endometrial carcinoma. So it's increasing from something like three to four folds into 40 folds or more with the atypical hyperplasia. And it's not uncommon perhaps with the practice of everybody in no, a biopsy would be diagnosed as atypical hyperplasia and on hysterectomy will find um, endometrial, well differentiated usually endometrial endometrioid carcinoma. So is an alayhum the way I should look or uh, think about endometrial hyperplasia without a tibia or with a tibia, I have to look into the architecture. So it's uniform changes in the glands with increase in the uh, gland to stromal ratio with telescoping versus a clonal expansion or abnormal clone in a background of what appears to be normal endometrium and then into the cytology uniform increase in the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio some mitosis against a really marked increase in the atypia sometimes which i find really very useful who were rounding of the nucleus but the elongated nucleus along with mitosis in comparison to the adjacent normal endometrial a gland. What about histological classification type? Okay, the hysterectomy, ma fi ha hyperplasia fi ha tumor. So we have one of the things that we need as pathologists is to classify the tumor. Is it type one or type two? This is what we've always grown and uh, practiced for so long in the uh, classification of endometrial carcinoma. كلنا بنعرف تايب 1 اتس البروتوتايب تبعها او الاساس تبعها هو اندومتريويد كارسينوما اتس ريليتد تو هايبر استرونيرجيزم اتس يوجوالي اسوشيتد وذ ايرلي جريد اند وذ ايرلي ستيج اند لو جريد اند اكسلنت بروجنوسز تايب 2 اتس احنا بنسميها بشكل عام نون اندومتريويد كارسينوما يوجوالي سين ان اولدر نون اوبيز وومن Remember لما حكينا على incidence of cancer and how we are expecting to have an increase in the uh, incidence of carcinoma globally and that the uh, prolonged life expectancy is one of the factors. Perhaps this is one of the tumors that would unfortunately be prevailing as we go on. There is a higher chance for metastasis. It usually presents with high stage. And of course, we all know this is associated with worse, worse uh, outcome. And then this classification, and recently in the WHO as well, that was released in 2020, we know that many of the previous um, uh, subtypes or variants were all really reorganized. And we know, for example, that endometrioid carcinoma, mucinous variant, is uh, mucinous endometrioid carcinoma is a variant now of endometrioid carcinoma. And the non endometrioid carcinoma, actually, the list is growing longer and longer with each and every uh, classification with the new entities. And I'll be addressing some of these, especially in the uh, slide seminar presentation. We know that this uh, Bokman classification type 1 versus type 2 really survived for more like 30 or 40 years and it was of a great educational and uh, epidemiological value. However, one issue that was related to the classification is that there wasn't really good concordance between different pathologists, especially expert pathologists, especially when it comes to high-grade endometrial carcinoma. Is it a grade 3 endometrioid carcinoma? Well, uh, this is non in type 2 non-endometrioid carcinoma. And sometimes there are some differences in the treatment, in the staging procedure. So the concordance was not really Great. خلينا نشوف how that uh, we're trying to overcome this issue. Now, الوراها الشغلة الثانية المطلوبة من الباثولوجيس is to grade the endometrial carcinoma. And حكيت endometrioid carcinoma in particular. It's type 1 that we grade. We don't grade type 2 because non-endometrioid carcinoma. Because are, these are all by default 
هذول كلياتهم باي ديفولت ار هاي جريد ما في حاجه اسمها لو جريد سيروس كارسينوما لايك ذا ايكوفالنت ان ذا اوفيريان تيومرز سو باي ديفولت كلياتهم هذول ار هاي جريد تيومرز وي دونت جريد نكتب عليها نوت ابليكابل وايل فور اندومتريويد كارسينوما ذيس از وير وي لوك انتو ذا جريد اند وي اولسو ترين سو سو فور سو لونج اون ثري تير جريدنج سيستم وير وي لوك ات ذا سوليد نون سكويمس نون Morular component, and accordingly we grade into grade one, two, or three according to the amount, to the percentage of the solid non-squamous non-morular component. And we know that the presence of cytologic atypia in the majority, شو يعني majority, 50% or more, it doesn't have to be 100%, 50% of more of the, what appears to be endometrioid grade one, showing a nuclear atypia higher than what, what is expected for a grade one, then this would be upgraded into a grade two. And مثل ما حكينا, this applies only to endometrioid carcinoma and its variants, and we always grade the adenocarcinoma, not the squamous carcinoma important. Now, the issue with this grading system, again, metal classification, there was not a great concordance between pathologists. What I would call a grade two, somebody else would, would call a grade three. Uh, grade three. So what uh, the proposed uh, grading, a new grading system is actually two tier, low grade, a grade one and two, and the grade is high grade, grade three, because apparently grade three endometrioid carcinoma Arab closer to the non-endometrioid carcinoma in terms of so many things, including the new concept in, endometrioid, in endometrial carcinoma, which is the molecular classification. Metal, metal, anywhere, all the systems, the brain, the uh, lymphomas, the uh, uh, breast. So molecular classification is becoming extremely important for personalized medicine and for determining the type of treatment, and so is the case with endometrial carcinoma. This was a seminal paper in 2013 that looked into an excess of 300 cases of endometrial, endometrial carcinoma, type 1 and type 2. كل أنواع الاندوميتريال كارسينوما and what uh, the outcome was that they were able to classify endometrial carcinoma into four molecular groups the polymutant, the uh, mismatch repair deficient, uh, the p53 abnormal وبعدين الجروب الأخيرة اللي is like diagnosis of exclusion was the biggest one which is the copy number low that is really with no specific uh, uh, um, molecular profile. Okay, so these are the four groups of molecularly defined endometrial carcinoma. And it it's actually translated into correlation with the outcome. So the poly, اللي لونها أزرق, had the best outcome the uh, copy number high, lonha ahmar, the worst outcome, and the other two groups have intermediate outcome. And if we look more into uh, uh, the distribution or the frequency of the uh, molecular groups of endometrial carcinoma, so we have the poly, it's the least common, Minsamiha ultra mutant because of the huge number of mutations associated with this type of a tumor. However, this is associated poly with excellent prognosis, and we'll see why it's very important to donate excellent prognosis. On the other hand, the copy number high, the prototype of it is serous carcinoma. Okay, usually this is associated with TP53 mutation and extremely poor prognosis. But then it contains in between the MSI, who are microsatellite instability, uh, uh, our uh, MMR deficient a group of endometrial carcinoma. It's hypermutant and is associated with intermediate prognosis. And then the largest group is the still not very well classified or defined, and it does not show any of uh, uh, the mutations or the si molecular signatures of the three other uh, groups. So how, this, how would this relate with morphology? P53 mutant tumors, perhaps the easiest. In home, they are the serous-like carcinoma. So this is easy to actually you know, uh, uh, to look at and exclude or uh, to render the diagnosis. El, um, the trick comes here with the polymutant and MMR deficient. The polymutant uh, uh, endometrial carcinomas actually most often 
are high grade endometrial carcinoma. Okay? Zakaru, remember that we've said in Nuhadoli groups are associated with excellent prognosis. So if we're going to treat according to the old system, taking into consideration the grade of the tumor, this, is, this will be considered hadolic tumors in general as high-grade tumors that would require intensifying the treatment. However, if we, if we render the molecular classification and the tumor is diagnosed as polymutant, perhaps no treatment is needed. So as if, and I'm going to say, and not only the CNS tumors, it seems that the molecular classification of endometrial carcinoma are not taken only the histological classification, but also the grade. So the importance of the grade in the context of molecular classes of endometrial carcinoma are not as important as in the old classification. And then we have the MMR deficient, and the M usually these are high grade and associated with intense peritumoral and intertumoral lymphocytic infiltrate. Bishbahu mean? Bishbahu colorectal carcinomas associated with Lynch syndrome, where we find the uh, Crohn's-like uh, lymphoid follicles as well as increase in the number of intra-epithelial lymphocytes. Exactly the same. It's like the group had lying in between, which is usually composed of low-grade endometrioid carcinoma, but this is not exclusive. So what really happened with the new classification, it, it improved the relevance and, uh, 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 of, um, of the grouping in terms for the treatment and as well as reduce the inter-observer variability with length, less emphasis on the grade and sometimes even changing uh, the treatment plan. Towards the end, in no polymutant, perhaps no treatment, in MMR deficient, perhaps immunotherapy, in P53 is the intensifying treatment, and the group in between is where perhaps will, will result to the traditional treatment. Tayyab, what about us living and working, practicing in low, intermediate, uh, uh, middle income countries? Uh, Egypt, Jordan, and uh, the region in, in general, because molecular classification or molecular markers and techniques will not be widely available. So there was a su suggestion of something that is called a proactive risk classifier for endometrial car cancer, uh, abbreviated as a PROMISE, and this is a try yeah, it's like a compromise, a trying to find solutions in order to be able to render the molecular classification using surrogate markers for to overcome the issue of the cost and the availability of those, uh, uh, the limited access to the, uh, to the testing in our region. So the algorithm, there are several variants. But in the idea, you, know, you start with some algorithms that start with the MMR proteins, and I hope they are available in, uh, in Egypt, Mojudin. Mm, great. So we start with the MMR proteins. We look is a can feed deficiency, loss of the nuclear stain in the presence of internal positive control. If yes, so this is MMR deficient. Khalasna. And the implications, the patient might benefit from immunotherapy. Is a group is MMR proficient? then what is really needed is the polymutation testing. And this has to be molecular. There is no surrogate marker for the polymutant tumors. If it's non-mutant, then we do the P53. And there is, as you know, excellent correlation between P53 immunohistochemistry that is validated, well-validated, and uh, uh, P53, uh, TP53 testing. So if it's P53 positive, uh, or a mutant apparent expression, P53 group, or is a wild type, so it's not deficient, it's not poly, it's not the P53 deficient type uh, or uh, apparent expression type, so this is the group in between. If you look into literature, there are several variations. See, some people start with the polymutation molecular, is a mutant, خلاص, and then if not a mutant, will go with the MMRs. If a mutant, that's it. If not a mutant, will resolve to P53. There are different variations. The important thing to understand or to know is that mutation, the tumors are ultra-mutant. علشان هيك ليش هي جاي البولي دائما يا أول خطوة يا تاني خطوة لأنه sometimes with the ultra mutation there might be mutation secondary mutations in p53 
and the importance of secondary mutations in p53 in the setting of the MMR proteins or the polymutation مش مهم. What is really important is whether the tumor is MMR deficient or polymutant. بيعتبروها, they consider this as part of the ultra or hypermutation that occurs in the tumor. Secondary event. It wasn't the driving event in the tumor occurrence. Okay. Now, into خلصنا. As a pathologist, I did the uh, uh, classification, the grading. If I'm lucky, عندي the molecular or the surrogate promise. Uh, algorithm, and then I have to start with uh, providing important staging information for the rest of the team. Myometrial invasion, I have to look into the depth and the pattern of invasion. And the depth, Zaman, can we talk about endometrial? Remember, I try to always, what is the FIGO stage and what is the equivalent TNM staging. So, the percentage of the myometrium that is involved, zero, يعني in the endometrium, or less than 50%, this is PT1A or FIGO1A, and if more than 50%, this is 1B. Actually, in, uh, in the, at King Hussein Cancer Center, where I practice with uh, gyne, gyne uh, oncology, MDC, they always ask me whether this is even less, let me tell them PT1A, less than 50% بطلبوا مني whether this is less than one third or not. Like the old classification, the old FIGO classification, TNM كان على three thirds, the inner third, the middle third, and the outer third. Because it appears to be associated, or it has some implications on the new adjuvant, on the adjuvant treatment following the discussion of the case. Depth of myometrial invasion with adenomyosis, it used to be a huge headache because the rule can, you have to measure the invasion from the adenomyotic focus from which the tumor arises, regardless of the relation of the adenomyosis with the overlying endometrium. We assign it PT1 or PT1A or, or PT1B. No longer is the case, thanks God. It depends what is really important is the location of the adenomyotic focus in the inner half, PT1A, in the outer half, PT1B. So it's similar to a myoinvasive tumor, regardless of whether this is involving an adenomyotic focus or not. What about exophytic and polypoid tumors? We have, we do not take into account a measurement from the for a smooth muscle tumor that is incorporated into the exophytic tumor or into the polyp. We have to either draw a line, fairly or an imaginary line, بحكيلي وين ال endomyometrial junction in the uh, in the resection, and from there, from that point, I measure at the depth of invasion and decide on the stage. And it's very important, the inno, the treatment, adjuvant treatment, will be determined by those small details that we write in our pathology report. And believe me, it's very important. إحنا نفكر إنه مش مهمة. It's extremely important. A patient might not receive any ter therapy with all the hassle associated with radiotherapy, with the bracket therapy, with chemotherapy, versus she has to, to, uh, to withstand all the complications and side effects for the benefit of uh, the survival and good quality of life and outcome. Patterns of myometrial invasion. So, come on, مش كل myometrial invasion is the same. We have the infiltrative pattern, which is the most common that we know in a glands associated with the, uh, with um, a stromal reaction, the usual pattern, or adenoma malignum-like pattern in which sometimes this is confusing. Lino, but I ask myself, is, this, is it really a malignant gland? Where is the stroma? So this sometimes might be confusing and overlooked, especially is Anna, I did not pay attention and I was not aware in you know, this pattern of invasion exists. Mumkin kaman ma adenomyosis. So I have really to be careful with this type of invasion in which the malignant but not so atypical glands dissect in between the muscle fibers the inner half and the outer half without associated um, a stromal reaction. Another pattern is the expansile or pushing pattern. And the more recently described pattern will be and sometimes I find it um, 
it's, it's troublesome, it's not easy to detect. MILF or the microcystic elongated and fragmented pattern of invasion. And in this pattern, at the advancing edge of the tumor, we show some hic rarefaction, some mixoid changes, and some inflammatory cells. Well, how do I inflammatory cells? These are tumor cells. They look exactly like macrophages. They are bland looking with bland nuclei and acidophilic cytoplasm. It's extremely important to recognize this pattern of invasion because apparently it is associated with adverse outcome. Perhaps this association is in relation to not being recognized by the pathologist, overlooked by the pathologist. Okay? Lymphovascular invasion. So, it's extremely to identify a lymphovascular invasion where at the advancing edge of the tumor. And nowadays, it has proven to be important to specify whether this is focal or extensive. Focal, three, less than three or less than five, and extensive more, three and more, or five and more. It doesn't matter. When it is extensive, it is واضحة. Okay, so usually hadol al edgy on the uh, on the core. I'm not quite sure whether this uh, 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 focal or extensive. لما طلع على other sections, the clue will be there. Okay, and a very important rule to remember: LVI does not upstage a tumor. يعني إذا شفت ال LVI, the tumor is in the inner third. And the LVI wasl into the outer half. Mabitsir PT1B. If the LVI is in the hilum of the ovary, Mabitsir uh, uh, stage three. Is a canat in the parametrium. So LVI does not upstage the presence only of LVI does not upstage the tumor. This is very important to keep in mind. It's extremely important to donate whether this is focal or extensive LVI because apparently with the endometrial carcinoma risk stratification to determine the treatment, hatta law can stage one endometrioid endometrial carcinoma with substantive or extensive LVI the treatment will be according to the high risk, high to intermediate risk endometrial carcinoma. And actually evidence is showing, is gathering, in you know, perhaps the presence or the extent of lymphovascular inv uh, uh, invasion is more important in stage one endometrial carcinoma than involvement of the inner or the outer half. So it's extremely important to be aware of this fact to look for it and to document it. But remember that there might be some artifacts or iatrogenic, what I call iatrogenic, uh, um, uh, misplaced tissues that might lead to improper diagnosis or assigning extensive vascular invasion to tumors that are not. And that takes me back to what we talked about the grossing. Laparoscopic surgeries appear to be associated with this iatrogenic pushing the tumor into the vascular spaces. I have to know whether this is open, laparotomy, or laparoscopic surgery. And fresh tissue, when they incise the endometrium, you might induce or they might induce some displacement of some of the fresh tissue, fresh friable tissue into the vascular spaces and then Mistakenly, I'll be writing in my report, you know, there is extensive lymphovascular invasion. So it's extremely important to know the type of surgery and to ask them, please, not to open the endometrium or the hysterectomy uh, before proper fixation. So what are the clues? Keep the RF. You know, this is uh, artifact or real. Our issue is fragmentations or vascular spaces. If you look really carefully, normal endometrium with the tumor. This is an excellent clue. Raqam tinin, which is very important as well, because the tumor low grade, expansile growth pattern, and this, there is really extensive, extremely extensive vascular invasion. There is disproportion between the tumor 
and the amount of the, or the number of vascular invasion. Hadoli two clues are very important, bil idafet, knowing whether this is laparoscopic surgery or not, and whether the tumor was incised while fresh or not. Lower uterine segment. Is it important? Why did I highlight lower uterine segment at the time of when I talked about the grossing? It is extremely important. We have to know, we have to be able to define the boundaries between the proper uh, uh, um, corpus, uteri corpus, and the cervix. Microscopically, it's very useful if we find, we, to, we, we track or we trace in the cervical glands, okay? This is very, very useful to define the edge of the uh, lower uterine segment. For another clue I personally use, well, in the cervical uh, um, uh, tissue in general, when you go back to your microscopes, there are always inflammatory cells. Usually, there are many plasma cells. So, this is what I'm talking about in the endocervix. Once those inflammatory cells start to decrease, and they get abruptly, this is the lower uterine segment. Okay? So, lower uterine segment involvement does not per se affect the stage. It doesn't change the stage. But, if the depth of invasion in the lower uterine segment is more than the depth of invasion in the corpus, we report the depth of invasion in the lower uterine segment. Okay? So it's like in indirectly it affected the stage. And number two, it's very important to differentiate between lower uterine uh, segment involvement and cervical involvement because with cervical involvement we upstage with series stage two. Lower uterine segment does not upstage. Muhim jiddan jiddan kaman nitzakkar in the lower uterine segment tumors are frequently associated with MMR deficiencies and Lynch syndrome. Ashan here it's extremely important and really in practice this happens frequently. أنا مش متأكدة بس ألوك إذا يأسيو during the MDC this is cervical or this is endocervical adenocarcinoma or this is endometrial carcinoma sometimes you cannot tell it's extremely important the treatment is different the prognosis is different the implication for the association with genetics and the need for genetic counseling and surveillance is different so we have to be able to differentiate between the involvement or not of the lower uterine segment so lower uterine segment involvement matters it's extremely important to report to be able to uh, identify and report and then cervical involvement crypts versus the stroma we know that the stroma is figo stage 2 or pt2 now they sometimes if you go for some of the data sets or checklists they ask to report the pattern of invasion sometimes the pattern uh, the depth of invasion with different uh, cut off points used by different groups claim to be associated with uh, with the outcome what is really important and from what my practice is they really need to know the percentage of cervical stromal invasion and the distance between the advancing edge and then the margin into the the paracervical margin a crypt or surface uh, cervical involvement used to be important in the old FIGO and TNM staging system. Hella, in the current one, we do not upstage if only the cervical involvement was with surface or a crypt. But it is still an important prognostic factor that might sometime in some uh, in some groups necessitate um, adjuvant treatment. So we have to report it. مش معناتها إنها does not upstage ما بكتبها. So لما يكون مكتوب عندي cervical involvement بكتب yes, stroma and crypts. Yes, crypts only. No, no stromal or crypt invasion. I have to be specific. I have to specify it. Uterine cirrhosis. مهم if it's breached or not. A breached يعني مخترقة. Okay, or يعني uh, so yes, cirrhosal in involvement is extremely important because this is our first PT3 uh, 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 stage and uh, the FIGO is the 3A. It's high risk associated with higher risk, risk of local regional recurrence and we do not have to see the tumor cells on 
the breach zero, the, the presence of ulceration, uh, lack of the uh, uh, fiber connective tissue or elastic tissue would suffice to render the case as a 3A. Adenexa, fallopian tubes, مهم جدا الأوفري. Is it important to be uh, reported? طبعا it's important because it upstages. بس المشكلة الأساسية, yeah, the main issue is when to assign endometrial cancer with ovarian metastasis, which would mean FIGO stage 3A, or synchronous primary endometrioid, endometrioid, endometrial cancer, in the endometrium and in the ovary, and most often both of them become low stage, usually stage 1A here and stage 1A here. It is really uh, an enigma that has uh, um, been subject to many literature uh, trying to find or define some factors which might help to differentiate whether this is metastasis or whether this is low stage synchronous uh, uh, tumors. And then there are some issues or some clues pertaining to the size of the tumor, the histological type of any grade, is in the, in the endometrium, endometrioid carcinoma, in the ovary, clear cell carcinoma. So probably these are two different tumors. The depth, the extent and depth of myo, uh, myometrial invasion, if it's deeply invasive, so probably the ovarian is coming from the endometrial carcinoma. LVI again, is a kind of extensive LVI invasion. Probably the ovarian is metastasis, a tubal invasion, endometrial hyperplasia, and ovarian endometriosis. Ovarian endometriosis probably would favor, you know, these are two independent primaries. Pattern of ovarian invasion. Is it small nodules with higher uh, lymphovascular invasion, or is it a big mass? that is replacing the whole ovary and bilaterality, one ovary or both ovaries. In Mantaq Bihki is a both ovaries, probably this is metastasis and the presence of additional metastasis. Now what is the recent uh, literature is telling us about el, el synchronous endometrioid, low grade, low stage, endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer and it's actually they are clonally related. It appears that at the end of the day, it appears that the ovarian carcinomas, low stage, low grade endometrioid carcinomas in the ovary are metastasis actually from the endometrioid carcinoma, probably through the tubal uh, prob uh, propagation or retrograde flow of the tumor cells. Still, yani this is what is really the recent literature is showing more evidence is needed to be collected. Parametrium and paracervix, important, of extremely important. You have to know the type of specimen you're receiving, the type of surgery that was performed. You have to look and specifically uh, uh, sample and properly design, designate in the cassette, you know, this is, the other sections are coming from the parametrium because this is a poor prognostic factor associated with other high risk factors and the stage would be 3B. What about the vagina? Bardo, it's very important to document whether there is vagina or not, if vagina is involved or not, because this upstages the, uh, the, the tumor. Now, vaginal involvement at time of diagnosis is uncommon, less than 1% associated with poor outcome. What is really common is recurrence of the tumor in the vagina, and this seems to be associated with good outcome. It does not really alter, it does not alter the stage or the outcome of the, uh, of the endometrial carcinoma. Margins, margins, please remember margins. Vaginal or uh, ectocervical, parametrial, and or paracervical. So, what is the margin? The margin, to me, simply, to free the organ. This is margin. Okay? And this margin, I have to ink and sample because it's extremely important to to determine uh, uh, the prognosis as well as the need for adjuvant treatment or not. Bladder and bowel biopsies, lazim nintibah whether this is serosa or mucosa. Serosa, stage 3A, PT3, part of the pelvic peritoneum, mucosa, stage 4. 
So, لما يعطيني بايوبسي يحكي لي this is bladder peritoneum مش معناته بتصير stage 4 if it's involved. It has to be mucosal. I have to see the tumor cells setting in the mucosa of the bowel or the bladder. قديش ضل معي وقت؟ 10 minutes بس؟ لا خلصت انا تقريبا. مش عارف قديش وصلت بس يلا. Omentum. Omentum. شغلة كتير مهمة that I have always to emphasize ودائما أنا بحكيها we cannot extrapolate from one organ to the other يعني الأومنتم in the ovary مختلفة قصته تماما عن الأومنتم in the endometrium أومنتم in the endometrium is metastatic okay? بغض النظر supra pelvic, infra pelvic, supra colic it does not matter أومنتم in endometrial carcinoma equals M1 or FIGO 4B طيب, how many sections do we take from the omentum? We have to section it serially. ما في إشي grossly visible from four to ten sections. بصراحة, I always go مع a larger number. I go for ten. Peritoneum, it's extremely important to know من وين جاي peritoneal biopsy. If it's pelvic peritoneum, it's stage three. If it's upper abdomen, it's stage four. لازم أكون عارفة. Peritoneal cytology, it's not important, used to be important, no longer important for the staging, but it's an important determinant of outcome, خاصةً بtype 2 carcinoma. Lymph nodes, مهم جداً. I have to learn by heart what are the regional and non-regional lymph nodes. خليني أمشي عليها هيك بسرعة. مهم جداً because actually now, I don't know if it's practice or not, um, in Egypt, but nowadays, especially with endometrioid, low grade, low stage uh, uh, endometrioid carcinoma, there is the practice of uh, sentinel lymph nodes and ultra staging in which the lymph node is dissected, incised, bread loafing along the long axis, two millimeters apart, less two millimeters, because this is the size of the micrometastasis. And then I have to examine one H and E and perform immunostain, one H and E immunostain, one H and E immunostain until the end. This is the way we stage the, or ultra stage the lymph nodes. Now remember, is a can in the pelvic lymph nodes, the FIGO or N stage is N1, 3C1, is a paraaortic, it's 3C2 or N2. It's extremely important, Kamal, they has a breast exactly. Isolated tumor cells, micrometastasis or macrometastasis. Nafs definitions, 200 cells or less than, less than 0.2 millimeters, this is the isolated tumor cells. They do not upstage the N stage. Micrometastasis, 0.2 millimeter to 2 millimeters, and then more than 2 millimeters macrometastasis. This is why we incise the lymph nodes 2 millimeters apart. Pelvic, usually the adequate pelvic uh, number of pelvic lymph adenopathy, uh, lymph node uh, retrieved at surgery is around 10. If the lymph nodes are fragmented, and this is frequently is the case, Saraha. From practice, this is frequently what happens. This is fragmented. We have to write it down. Remember, in no inguinal lymph node or upper abdomen lymph node equivalent to M, okay? M1 metastasis. Isolated tumor cells. لازم أعمل لهم immune stains. I cannot مرات كتير exactly like in this case. It's just isolated tumor cells. They do not upstage, but it's important to document. Micrometastasis. This is where I have an, a group of tumor cells usually confirmed. Hey, هم هون موجودين. بصراحة, in practice, if I see this, I might not be sure. Perhaps these are histiocytes. So we have to do cytokeratin or preferably cytokeratin 7 to try to minimize the uh, um, crossing over with the immunostain. And then an important pitfall. Not, that, not all that glitters is gold. This is metastasis. We have to know in, in pelvic lymph nodes frequently endosalbendrosis. This is not metastatic and a pathologist, a good pathologist should be able to, uh, to pick up this. Frozen section, do we do frozen sections? Bill uterus, sentinel lymph nodes, yes. Myometrial invasion, no. Refuse. Urfudu, matrudu, matrudu alayhum. Ana hini bahki lkum. Don't, because we're going to induce all the artifacts that we spoke about previously. Taya. 
perhaps the ancillary studies because of the time I'll be عليهم because I'll be addressing these actually بكل ال while I'm presenting. راح أحكي على هاي interesting case على السريع. 70 year old female patient with postmenopausal bleeding. She did DNC, many hemorrhagic curatings, and endometrial polyp, and a tumor. Fee part that is glandular, very nice. A nuclei kind of rounded. Perhaps there are some secretions, hemorrhage in the background, and then some more solid areas, and what appears to be cartilage. So, carcinosarcoma. ERPR negative, P53, wild type, mosaic pattern, is she positive, is she negative, will positive, is she strong, is she weak, so this is mosaic pattern, P16, command, MAFI block positivity, mosaic pattern of staining, GATA3, mesonephric, 